Good morning, everyone. I'm Jeff Liebenson, president of the IAEL, and I'd like to welcome you to the IAEL Medem Legal Summit. This is the 44th anniversary of the IAEL and our activities here at Medem. We were formed at Medem. And this year, we're gonna continue our tradition, and I'm really confident we're gonna have the best program we've ever had. We're gonna start this morning with our legal update session. We will follow it with a networking break at 11.30 so you can all mingle and, and talk with each other and catch up and meet new friends. At noon, we will have our IAEL masterclass. And this year, the masterclass is on the anticipated new US copyright legislation, the Music Modernization Act, and its international implications. Then after that, we're going to have, for the first time, a lunch program, which is gonna be in the Verriere Grand Auditorium here in the Palais. We're co-sponsoring it, we're very pleased to say, with Music Canada, and the panel program there will be on the power of grassroots artist advocacy and a multi-territorial approach to the value gap. And that's a perfect program for us this year because every year we publish an annual book, and this year, our book is Finding the Value in the Gap, and we will be releasing the book today at our afternoon session, beginning right back here in this room at 2.30, uh, where we're gonna have contributors from all over the world that have participated in the book here to share their views with you. After the book session ends at 4.30, we'll have our IAEL cocktails. That'll be on the fifth floor at the Verriere Californie. And then this evening, our IAEL members' dinner. Uh, this year, our dinner is at 7.30 at a new location, Plage Golan. It's the first beach restaurant that you reach when you leave the Palais on the right. Uh, we're very excited uh, to see as many of you there as possible. And if you have not RSVP'd yet and you wish to attend, uh, please speak with Marcel or Lee outside or with me so we can advise the restaurant how many are coming. Um, tomorrow, we have our annual general meeting, the AGM. Uh, we'll discuss all the business of the IAEL. We'll discuss what next year's book topic will be. So if anyone has any ideas or suggestions about topic or editor for next year, uh, you know, please speak with us or come to the AGM tomorrow. Um, but First, to kick us off, it's our IAEL legal update. Uh, the legal update has been one of our core presentations over the years. We'll go around the world, we'll uh, discuss the most important issues facing our industry. The leaders of our legal update are Susan Abramowitz and Peter Marks. Uh, Susan is partner and head of entertainment and sports law at Gowling, the prominent law firm in Toronto, Canada. She's also program director of the Osgood Hall Law School and a lecturer on entertainment law at Osgood and at McGill. Peter has extensive experience in intellectual property, media, and entertainment law, and he is a founding partner at Max von Rost Vermesch and Partners in Brussels, uh, and he's an executive committee member of the IAEL. Susan and Peter took over leadership of the legal update last year, so we know we're in very good hands. And so I'm very pleased to welcome Susan and, Susan and Peter. Thanks so much, Jeff. New York, London, Paris, Munich. Everybody talk about pop music and the law. Welcome to the 2018 edition of the legal update put on by the International Association of Entertainment Lawyers. I'm Susan Abramovich. Together with my co-chair, Peter Marks, we will take you around the world from Los Angeles to Lagos to fill you in on the most important updates in music and copyright law to equip all of you for the year to come. We'll touch on some of the big headlines of the year, the hashtag MeToo movement, terrorism at live shows, and splashy lawsuits involving Johnny Halliday, Zeppelin, Marvin Gaye, and Spotify. We'll also examine recent developments in internet regulation in terms of privacy and hate speech. Finally, we'll explore changes or hopefully upcoming changes in the legal infrastructure and their economic impact on the music industry in Canada, the EU, and Nigeria. First, 
to get you in the mood. A music compilation touching on all our subjects. Good morning. One of the songs we heard in the music mix was Johnny Holiday's Restez Vivant. That is not exactly what the artist did because the French rock star passed away in December of last year. And when artists die, at least when they have been successful, we see often bitter disputes over the inheritance and often moral rights are involved and come into play. And since moral rights made the front page in France last year, we asked our first speaker, Camille Burkhardt, Burkhardt sorry, from Nomos to give an overview of some recent case law. Hi. Um, so moral rights, as you know, is a big specificity of French law, which is known for being very protective of its authors and performers. Authors like composers or writers or directors have several prerogatives, sorry. Um, the first have a right to the respect of their name and the quality, which means that they can actually ask to be specifically mentioned in relation with the work um, that they created. They also have the right of the, to the respect of the integrity of their work, which means that they can oppose any modification or deletion of their work which, is, uh, which may distort their work. They also have a right of disclosure of their work, which means that initially they're the ones who decide whether or not they want to make their work public and when. And finally, authors have a right to withdraw and repent. So if they indemnify the entity to whom they've assigned their exploitation rights, they are actually entitled to ask that their work be modified or for its exhibition to stop. Performers, on the other hand, in France, have also have moral rights, but which are less wide than those granted to authors under the French IP code. They have a right to the respect of their name and their quality, like authors, and they also have a right to the respect of their performance, which means that they can also oppose any modification or alteration of their performance if that modification is likely to distort their performance. All those moral rights have specific characteristics in France. First, they are inalienable, which means that an author or performer is actually not entitled to waive his rights, and he's not entitled to sign it to a third party. Secondly, those rights are imprescriptible. And finally, those rights are perpetual, which means that they remain after the death of the author or the performer, and those rights are assignable to the heirs. No matter all those characteristics, French case law, recent French case law has shown us that some conditions precedents may apply to the exercise of those rights, and that those rights actually do not always prevail. The first interesting case is the Jean Ferrat case, with a ruling of the Cour de Cassation, our Supreme Court, of the 21st of March 2018. That ruling concerns the issue of the exercise of moral rights when several authors have contributed to one work, like a musical work. The Supreme Court ruled that uh, if a co-author of a work of collaboration can act alone to defend his rights, it is subject to the fact that his contribution can actually be individualized. If that's not the case, then the author must implicate all his co-authors within the proceedings, or he will otherwise be found inadmissible. 
Uh, and in this particular case, um, a publisher had published a book of, uh, after Jean Ferrat's death, which reproduced several extracts of lyrics of songs to which Jean Ferrat participated, but without authorization. So the holder of Jean Ferrat's moral rights introduced an action, but the courts noted that the lyrics had been written with other authors and that Jean Ferrat's contributions could not be individualized, so he was found inadmissible. The second um, interesting recent case is the Henri Salvador case with a ruling of the Supreme Court of the 31st of January, 2018, which regarded the questions of both moral rights and the image rights of a performer. The spouse of the late Henri Salvador had introduced an action against the producer of compilations of songs of the artist because she claimed that the compilations were first of a very poor sound quality and that the physical formats included pictures of the artist but without any authorization. So the claim was partly based on the moral rights of the performer because she considered that the compilations were a violation of the artist's rights to the respect of his performances. But the court ruled that the exploitation of the performances of an artist as a compilation was not in itself a violation to the respect due to his performances. But this case was actually quite circumstantial because the courts considered that they were not in a position to actually assess the sound quality of the recordings because the spouse didn't provide any concrete elements to prove her case. Her claims were also based on the image right of the, of the artist, but they were also rejected because unlike the artist's moral right, which is perpetual, the Supreme Court ruled that the image right of a person lapses upon his death and is not transmissible to the heirs. The last recent interesting case in France is obviously the Johnny Halliday case and we got a first ruling of the Tribunal of Nanterre acting in summary proceedings on the 13th of April, 2018. So as you know, following the death of Johnny Hallyday, his children discovered that their father had disinherited them to the benefit of his wife, Laetitia Smet, pursuant to a will that was subject to US law. This means that the moral rights of Johnny Hallyday may not be going to be transmitted to his children, but only to his wife. So, the two kids, Laura Smet and um, David uh, Hallyday, introduced several actions to notably challenge the will and its consequences. And in those summary proceedings, one of their claims was made against Laetitia Hallyday, the wife, and also against Warner, who was, um, which was Johnny Hallyday um, recording company. And the claim was regarding the future new album of Johnny Hallyday because he recorded a few songs before passing away but the last mixing and post-production works had been finalized after his death. So the two kids asked the tribunal to order that they communicate within 48 hours from the ruling, either the mock-up, the master, or the original file of the recordings, as well as the packaging of the last album, because it, contains, it may contain pictures of the artist. And in the alternative, they asked to be at least authorized to listen to the album to check the respect, the respect of the performances of their father. In the end, the tribunal confirmed a few things. First, that the recording company actually owns the recordings, the master of the artist, pursuant to their, its agreement with the artist. Also, the mixing and post-production works that were carried out after Johnny's death were actually done under the supervision of people that Johnny had chosen and in accordance with his instructions. So the tribunal found that there were not enough elements provided by the parties to establish a risk of a violation of the respect due to his performances. And finally, regarding the image right, the tribunal also ruled that this right extinguished upon the death of Johnny Hallyday. So the claim regarding the submission of the packaging was also rejected. All those recent decisions actually raised several questions on the French law. As you may have noted, those cases were all introduced by as and not by the authors or the performers themselves, which is actually quite usual in France because living authors and performers do not usually introduce actions on the basis of moral rights. However, our current legislation is not very clear as to how moral rights are actually transmissible to the as, For example, it remains unsure whether moral rights can be subject to a will made under US law, 
which will be one of the issues to be decided in the other Johnny Hallyday proceedings. And the tribunal might actually decide that the exploitation rights be transferred to the wife and the moral rights be transferred to the children, which may cause a lot of difficulties. Also regarding the image rights and the fact that said rights may not be transmitted to the heirs is for some of us quite questionable and raises some risks. Uh, firstly, this right is indeed a personal right, but it should also be considered as an assignable, assignable economic right since it represents a, a source of important revenues. And finally, if that right is not transmissible to the heirs after the death, the death of an artist, then it's not really clear what happens if the artist signs exclusive image rights agreements before he passed away, and we can wonder if those agreements will still apply. Thank you, Camille. Great, well, moving along, uh, thank you, Monica. Um, we heard the song Toy on our little mixtape by Net of Israel, who won, I might point out, for Israel, the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, and we can see that uh, the hashtag MeToo movement is starting to permeate song lyrics that we're hearing. Monica is gonna talk to us about how it's also been permeating the entire music industry and how it could be a force for good. Monica Tashman is a member of Fox Rothschild's nationwide entertainment practice and a prominent advocate for women in the music industry. Thanks, Monica. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Bonjour. First, I want to thank the IAL for this amazing opportunity to be here. Great excuse to not be in New York. I'll take a cloudy day in the south of France over any day in New York. Uh, <laughs> okay, so let me start this presentation uh, by giving you some full disclosure. As a woman in the music business for 25 years, I have some experience with this particular topic. I started when I was really young, doing club promotion in Miami in the 80s, first at a teen disco, then at real clubs in New York and Miami. Then I went on to stints in publicity, management, radio promotion before becoming a lawyer. And in fact, um, one of the reasons I decided to become a lawyer and make a change in career paths is because some guy 25 years ago told me I'd get further faster if I would just put out. Look, I started in this business as a teenager doing club promotion in the 80s in Miami. I had a thick enough skin. But for whatever reason, on that particular day, I was just done. I was sick and tired of dealing with creeps like him telling things, saying things like that to me and undermining my accomplishments. So my 20-year-old self decided the best way for me to get a competitive edge was to quit a job I actually really loved, um, rack up massive loans, and go to law school to be an entertainment lawyer. Figuring a woman with a law degree uh, next to her name might be able to get some respect for her mind uh, and prove the jerks wrong. So when uh, Me Too started last October as a viral movement uh, and Alyssa Milano said, you know, if you had ever had any experience with sexual harassment, reply Me Too, I used the hashtag. Uh, but I wasn't the only one. 12 million other people on Facebook in the first 24 hours also used the hashtag. Uh, an avalanche of allegations uh, against powerful men in Hollywood and elsewhere followed, which gave way to studies, investigations, surveys, et cetera, that exposed the magnitude of the problem uh, in plain sight. Um, the statistics are pretty crazy, right? 94% of all women in the entertainment, of 94% of the representative sample of all women in the entertainment business have experienced some level of harassment. And only one in four have actually come forward uh, to, uh, to, 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 for a claim or to you know, even go to human resources. So obviously it's a pervasive problem. This amount of stats can't possibly uh, be lying, right? It's, we can't be in denial. Uh, and our business, the music business, is no exception. We have seen and heard of sexual assault, uh, harassment allegations in our business in the last nine months. Although we don't know the result of these internal investigations, um, but we do know that they prompted the parting of ways for a number of very uh, high profile individuals. Uh, and the accused and the results were hardly surprises. So <clears throat> putting aside what happens behind closed doors, let's talk a little bit about what sexual harassment is. Um, sexual harassment um, is a form of discrimination. It emanates from uh, the US Constitution, 14th Amendment provides equal protection under the laws, uh, and it's further codified in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, the law specifies that men and women can be victims and perpetrators of sexual harassment, and to qualify for harassment, the behavior has to be frequent or severe enough to create a hostile 
working or offensive working environment. Um, there's basically two types. Okay, there's a quid pro quo, which is like your classic. All right, here we go. Uh, is your classic supervisor speaking to a subordinate and offering a employment benefit or detriment in you know in exchange for a sexual favor? Um, and then, and, and what you're really seeing more of in the news right now in the U.S. is the hostile workplace, uh, which is a, it's it's very involved, a very involved analysis and provides uh, requiring evidence that conduct is both unwelcome, unsolicited. Uh, that it's you know considered hostile, a reasonable person would think so. Um, it's actually the courts use both subjective and objective tests. Um, I want to be clear about what sexual harassment isn't. Uh, sexual harassment is not simple teasing, offhand comments, or isolated incidents. This is actually in the law itself. Um, there are so many factors, and I only have 10 minutes, so I'm just going to flip through these slides a little bit. You want to talk more? Please just. Contact me. <laughs> um, so uh, the framework is involved. There's both subjective and objective tests, and there's lots of shades of gray. But my point is that putting aside what the what the law is, there's a matter of practicality that we need to deal with, um, and that's what really people are looking for. Because of course, when we move to a claim and we go into the legal framework, that's when everything has gone wrong, right? We need to sort of deal with these things so that things go right to begin with. Um, See, so uh, this is my litmus test. When in doubt, think twice or just don't. Um, always strive for better judgment and self-control. Um, this is risky business, and you know we do need to be considerate of the people that we work with and for. Uh, you know, it can forget the legal claims. You can have issues with loss of productivity, awkwardness, hostility, loss of focus, uh, which is. Um, you know, which can be very detrimental to the workplace. Uh, but you know, these are basically the, the things that you should just avoid, right? And this is common sense. Um, my point about Me Too, and I think the point that is lost in the news cycle, is that the takedowns that we've been seeing, um, although necessary, are not necessarily the point of the Me Too movement. The point of the Me Too movement is that it's shining a spotlight on the industry's long running, running tendency to brush off bad behavior and overt sexism. Um, it's like clicking on the lights in what you thought was a posh club <laughs> after everyone is left and seeing how disgusting and dirty it actually is. Uh, we are now struggling to see the glorification of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll ethos has led to a culture that's been extremely inhospitable to women, which has allowed harassment to fester. So back to those closed doors and internal investigations. Before last fall, these things would happen. No one would even really know about them, right? Um, and things were settled with payoffs, non-public arbitration. Uh, one or both of parties were, you know, under NDAs. There was no embarrassment. There was no paper trail. There was no example set. There was no accountability, um, and it basically provided a atmosphere of permissiveness. Um, you know, there were basically three actors in, in all of these things, right? There was the accused, who could spin the alleged um, allegations into anything he wanted. There was the accuser who had to live with the, um, with the fact that they came forward and nothing happened. And, um, and then there was us, who don't really know the guilt or innocence of anyone that's involved. Um, so continuing doing as we have done only gets more of the same, um, and it doesn't move us forward. My point is that Me Too opened the door to the conversation about sexual harassment uh, that we've never really had before. I've had the most interesting conversations here at Meetum in just the last two days. These are conversations that wouldn't have happened last year. Um, but the consensus is that no one should have to endure or tolerate physical or emotional abuse to be in business because of their sex or because they wouldn't have it with their boss. Surviving hazing isn't and shouldn't be in anyone's job description. Um, sexual safety at work should be a non-issue. Um, and until now, most women in the entertainment business, as shown by those statistics, you know, just thought that it was something that they had to deal with and par for the course. The best thing about the Me Too movement is that both men and women now understand that that should not be the case. And as a result, there's going to be a change in our culture, which brings me to the point of this presentation. Um, now what? Um, so the law comes into play when everything goes wrong. Uh, we need to provide guidelines for behavioral norms for our clients uh, from the get-go. It's what Inclusion Writers in Hollywood's all about. It's about setting a mindset and an intention. Um, we need to do that for, for our clients as well. 
when we boil down what any agreement is at its essence, it's about expectations. It's about the way that parties deal with each other. Um, I think we need to set the expectation that harassment won't be tolerated. Um, and I have a couple of recommendations, things that we can do right now, ways that we can, as lawyers, look at the agreements that we're both drafting and marking up and think about it under the lens of discrimination and sexual harassment. How can we put this overlay in this world where the consensus is that this shouldn't be happening into what we do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, my first suggestion is, doing it when we see confidentiality in arbitration clauses, to be thinking about sexual harassment and thinking how we can uh, create protections, perhaps excluding sexual harassment claims from um, arbitration provisions and NDAs. Um, oh my God, I only have a, a minute left. Okay, um, <laughs> and the intention is to flip the narrative so that it is a sign of weakness to report harassment, but rather show strength. Uh, if you think about it, if a claim is valid, the person reporting is actually doing the company a great service by reporting or stopping a hazardous condition. Um, everyone in this room knows the fear of consequences, uh, so uh, let's lay out the legalities. Uh, let's get to my third point. We can bring these numbers down if we make some changes in what we do for a living and we uh, think about harassment and discrimination as we uh, go through our days. Um, and then we can bring these numbers up uh, if we go out of our way to, uh, to support women and to create a safe environment for them to thrive. Um, more stats. Uh, if we clean up our club and attract and retain more women to the business, more women will be, will, will, will be here. They'll be, There'll be less harassment, stronger voices, better leadership, and according to this study, maybe more some more money. That's good. Um, lawyers have always been instruments of change, so while I'm inspired by the Me Too movement, I'm exhilarated by what we together can do to transform our business so that people of either sex with the drive, skills, and talent can succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Monica will have to leave us because uh, Monica is on another panel here at Medium. Um, it's interesting how the Me Too topic also raises many questions on moral rights. Remember Kevin Spacey's performance that has been removed from the movie All the Money in the World. So Kevin makes some Spacey was replaced by Christopher Plummer. How legal would this be in uh, Europe in the light of the actor's rights as a performer? So. Our next speaker would be an interesting topic, that would be an interesting topic for, for next year maybe, uh, to link both speeches, the moral rights and the, the US uh, uh, Me Too uh, movement. Our next speaker is Goetz Schneider Rothaar of Führmann Wallenfels. Goetz will talk about the controversial German hate speech law. I will not pronounce myself the name of that law in German because otherwise there would be no time left to speak for Goetz. <laughs> That's true, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Peter and Susan, and uh, yeah, you're right. And um, I don't know why we always pick those names for, for things like laws. It's uh, called the Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz. So it's, it's, it's very, it's obviously very German. So um, considering the number of hate speech posts on Facebook and Twitter and the release of infringing um, content, there is an obvious need um, to ban unlawful content from social media platforms. Um, in Germany, we do have a history, and um, unfortunately, but um, we also have a, a history in um, racist posts and anti-Semitic racist posts and uh, by the AFD party, which is the right-wing party, um, the populists from the um, AFD in Germany. And we have uh, a lot of experience about uh, fake news concerning refugees within the last years. So there's an uh, obvious need to impose more obligation on the social media platforms to remove unlawful content. And also on a European scale, um, the European Commission agreed with Facebook, Microsoft and Twitter uh, to a code of conduct on counter countering illegal hate speech online. So, there's obviously also um, more like an, like an agreement to uh, find a way to get along with this um, hate speech uh, problem. So since January 1, we have this new hate speech law, as we call it, the um, hate, uh, the, the, the um, Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz, as I said. And uh, 
it's, uh, it simply demands social media sites to remove hate speech, fake news and illegal material, which is defined as uh, unlawful content. So if there is a complaint of unlawful content, such as hate speech, um, it has to be removed within 24 hours. This is one obligation. In complex cases, the platform can take more time, up to a week, and, uh, but so this is the maximum. Usually it's 24 hours. And there are other obligations by this new law. The hate speech law applies to uh, social networks like Facebook and Twitter. And uh, a definition is given here, as we do not have so much time. Um, I can just say it is for Facebook, it is for Twitter, it is for YouTube and all other video platforms as well. So it doesn't apply to platforms offering own journalistic or editorial content. That's made clear in the law as well. So what is considered unlawful content? It's defined in the law as um, content that fulfills the requirements of different offenses described in the German Criminal Code. So it's from the dissemination of propaganda material of unconstitutional organizations to a, as I say, simple defamation. Everything is in there, but it still refers to severe um, offenses that uh, are in the Criminal Act. So it's not quite clear if it also comprises each infringement of a right. So another obligation is that the hate speech law requires social media now to put in place a comprehensive complaint structure so that posts can quickly be reported and handled. So it's all about transparency and to make it easier to follow the entire procedure. And if the platform receives more than 100 complaints per year about illegal posts, the platform even needs to publish a semi-annual report on all complaints handled in German. And this report must be published on the platform's website or in the Federal Gazette. So that's another obligation the, um, the platforms have. They have to back up illegal posts for at least 10 weeks to guarantee a preservation of evidences. And uh, the big issue is that uh, there can be fines between Euro 500,000 and up to 5 million Euro in case that uh, the social media platform doesn't comply with these obligations. So there is a lot of criticism. And um, to be honest, it's only criticism at that stage. And you will see there's, except of, my, of the outlook I'm giving, um, it's, it's only criticism. What they say, the critics outside, and what I can, also, can only underline is that the law usually does not counteract fake news because wrong news are not prohibited in Germany. As in each democratic system, wrong news are, not, wrong news are allowed. So, and as hate speech must consist of illegal elements, so the law only takes effect for, as I said, more severe cases. There must definitely be doubts um, concerning the legal qualification of the staff responsible for the deletion of posts or the blockade of access. Imagine, and there are situations where the staff deletes posts or block access if they only have general concerns of a possible illegality. Besides the fact that uh, penological fundamentals uh, can be bypassed and will be bypassed, no one's asking about justification no one's asking about culpability, for instance. And some critics, and these are very strong, uh, is very strong criticism, see uh, an infringement of the freedom of opinion, speech, the freedom of the press, in case uh, of posts with evaluative elements, or if social media platforms support specific political directions. This opens up a huge space for censorship, and that's definitely true. So, and Google and YouTube, they have, as we can all imagine, they have uh, great concerns about this, and they also see a censorship coming with this law, 
because of fixed statutory rules, even if they only have doubts, social media platforms, and to be honest, as I said, I think they are, they are true, um, they are right, platforms literally, literally have to delete posts. And Facebook criticizes the short notice for deleting posts and wants the state to take over more responsibility on those problems with hate speech, which is also true to a certain, uh, to a certain extent. So, my greatest concern is that uh, the law imposes public duties to private companies. As you have this new stage where um, you have complaints and uh, the platforms decide what is hate speech, um, you, it turns social media platforms into judges, juries and executors. And this is my main concern about this, about this law. I've talked to some people from the music industry about it and they fear that artists like rap musicians um, and uh, record companies could uh, become severely limited uh, with the promotion of their songs and videos on social media platforms. And uh, Facebook is already deleting videos they think are not appropriate. So this is also a concern I can totally understand and is also a concern for the freedom of the artist. So, so what's the outlook? The outlook is definitely that the hate speech law in its actual version cannot solve any problem out there. We're talking about, I think, 300 or 400 complaints from 1st January until today, which is nothing. And um, so it can solve the problem. But the need for a strong and transparent legal solution stays. There's no question about that. So at that stage, our hate speech law brings more censorship than a relief from an unlawful content. But on the long run, and we just discussed it with some colleagues um, before this uh, presentation, it, is, it can be a helpful solution, perhaps together with code of conducts and uh, contractual agreements. And um, so it still bears the chance to become a reliable, legal, and finally helpful solution. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, Getz. That was interesting. Although the legislation may be flawed, as you pointed out, it is a step forward towards the principle of having these plat very powerful platforms with a very powerful information that they're moving yeah. to take some responsibility. So at least from, from a higher level, it's, it's important. Um, we're going to move to the US now. Ken, please feel free to rise up. We're going to get an update on rise two up. very important uh, infringement cases in the US, Blurred Lines and Stairway to Heaven, and also uh, Ken will fill us in on what's going on with Wixen suing Spotify. There we go. Okay. Everybody get up. Now I'm good. the Marvin Gaye song. So what happens in, in uh, the United States, the, the, we have um, experts come in, and uh, in this case, there were two experts on either side, one of which um, put in evidence that there were what she called a constellation of similarities between those two things you just heard. Now, some people on, on listening to that the first time, I've taken this, I've given this speech many times and I've taken polls and some people are just, oh yeah, they sound the same, but then when you really get down to the nitty gritty detail of it, um, the protectable elements really are not the same and that's certainly my point of view. The trial um, took, uh, I think, a, a week and a half or so. There were many elements in the courtroom that I think had a lot to do with the way the, way the, the verdict came out, one of which was the fact that Robin Thicke, who was the defendant, had been um, uh, deposed and he said some, some not such good things about, about the song and about uh, his state of mind when he, when he created the song. There was a, a lot of um, implications in, in the courtroom 
you know, that he really didn't care much about what happened. He tried to blame Pharrell Williams for it. In any event, the trial, uh, as many of you know, uh, resulted in a verdict against uh, the gays, and it was it, it was uh, uh, in favor of the gays, and it was five it was five million dollars. It was appealed. I got involved in the appellate stage representing um, musicologists from around uh, the United States. I also had one from uh, a foreign country. And we basically made an argument that um, that this decision was going to you know, que quell creativity because the, um, the, the artists wouldn't be able to tell where the line was, uh, the line being blurred, between you know, copyright infringement and not copyright infringement. Um, the appellate court uh, affirmed the decision, and um, the defendants decided to move for what's called an en banc hearing. So where the thing is right now is that they've gone back to the Court of Appeal. We had a three-judge panel at the, at the appellate level. Now they're trying to get the entire panel of judges of the Ninth Circuit to look at it again and review it. And there, are, there, are, there is a new issue which I raised in another brief that I put in for the musicologist again, um, which, which is that in the jury instruction, they said that the inverse ratio rule would apply so that um, because it was so clear that there was access, they would only have to prove a little bit of substantial similarity because the Ninth Circuit has this inverse ratio rule, supposedly, and, and it, we are trying to argue that that is not, in fact, what that rule meant, that all that rule meant was that if you had a lot of access, that you then could move on to the, to the substantial similarity stage, but you'd still have to prove substantial similarity. That case is now sitting on appeal. It's probably not going to uh, come out of appeal for six or seven months, what I'm told, because the en banc process takes that much time. At the same time as that case was going on, we had the, uh, the Led Zeppelin spirit case. Um, if I can get that music come up, I will. There we go. <laughs> different things. That, when I heard that for the first time, it, it, it blew my mind, because I, I can't believe how similar that really sounded. That case had its own uh, peculiar issues as well. The first one being that the uh, infringement, Led Zeppelin, was created many, many, many years ago in the early 70s, and nobody ever sued. Nobody ever, the person who wrote Taurus, which was the second song, never brought the lawsuit. After he died, his name was Randy California, his heirs never brought the lawsuit up until the Supreme Court in our country ruled in the Perella MGM case that you could, in fact, bring a copyright lawsuit for long ago uh, infringements but you'd be limited to the damages just for the last three years. It used to be, I don't know if it, internationally the concept is called latches, but it's basically if you wait too long, you, you waive your rights. Uh, but now the Supreme Court has said that in copyright infringement, that is no longer a defense. So they went in and they, and they brought this lawsuit. So there was this feeling at the, at the beginning of the case that um, they had waited so long, what, you know, what was this all about? Now, contrary to the defense witnesses and blurred lines, um, Jimmy Page was a tremendous witness. The lawyer for the plaintiffs, and I wasn't part of this trial, but the lawyer for the plaintiffs was uh, angered the judge in many different ways. I, I wasn't there again, but people have described it as he, he was just a little bit unhinged, maybe it's a good word. Um, the big issue in that case, which uh, in case you don't know, Led Zeppelin won that case. Um, there are, it's an appeal there as well. Uh, in the same circuit where the Blurred Lines case is currently pending. So there's, there's going to be some issues decided. And in that case, we have an anachronism in that in the United States, the copyright law changed in 1976. And both of these cases involved songs that were uh, allegedly infringed, which were created prior to 1976. And the issue is, what is the scope of the copyright under, um, in, in a lawsuit today involving a pre-76 recording. And in both, in the Blurred Lines case, the, ar the, the argument was that the copyright should be limited to 
the sheet music as it had been recorded. And in the case of Marvin Gaye, in the case of many artists, the sheet music is not necessarily an indication of everything that went into the recording. It's usually just some shorthand. And back then, um, you know, the, the sheet, sheet music that you see in the copyright office could be a chord lead sheet, but certainly doesn't have all the elements of the song. Uh, in that case, they, um, they ruled that, the sheet, that it was not going to be limited to the sheet music. And in the Led Zeppelin case, they limited, um, excuse me, they, they limited in both cases to the sheet music. The thing in the Blurred Lines case was they lost anyway. Even with the limitation to the sheet music, they still lost. In the, in the Led Zeppelin case, they won because the Randy California sheet music didn't have many of the elements that you, that you heard when you heard those two songs. So now the Ninth Circuit is going to be forced to decide whether or not the sheet music is a relevant limitation to the scope of the copyright and whether it should be the sound recording. In the Led Zeppelin case, for instance, the jury came out with a question while they were deliberating, and they asked to hear uh, music, and a lot of argument, the judge did not let them play the recording. So the argument is that that was um, very limiting to the plaintiff's case. I'm running low on time, so I'm going to switch off to Spotify. One of the themes that, that, that fits to all three of these cases is the notion that there was a big change in the Copyright Act in 1976, and we're now dealing with new technologies and um, uh, other things that make elements of the pre-76 analysis um, not work anymore. And the Spotify case is a perfect example. Um, Spotify went public, as you know, this year in the face of massive litigation, which, which was about the payment of royalties for pre-1972 sound recordings. In the U.S., sound recordings were not copyrighted until 1972. Um, so if you um, get a compulsory license um, or, or rely on the safe harbor that, that's in the the Copyright Act as it is today, uh, you, you conceivably don't have the rights for the pre-72 recordings. Um, there was a big class action. The class action just settled. There's a lot of controversy as to whether the amount uh, that, that was settled was, was enough and sufficient. I'm not going to get into the details of that because the MMA panel will, will get into some detail about that settlement. But suffice it to say, for this purpose, that Wixon Company and Bob Gaudio, the Four Seasons, and the Blue Water Music Services Company have sued, have opted out of the class settlement, and, uh, and there are still those lawsuits pending. Um, and that, in the back, it, with the backdrop of the Music Modernization Act, which has its one of its provisions, uh, a remedy to this pre-'72 um, conundrum. And I'm seeing double zeros, so that's all I got. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, now it is time for GDPR, or the goddamn privacy rules. Imagine you want to go to a popular music festival. Tickets are sold out in less than one hour. Ticket sales start, you're in front of your computer. First come, first served. But is this really true? Thanks to wristbands or fancy bracelets with ship, a ship which, which also serves as a payment method for food and beverage, the organizer knows that last year, for example, Susan, on my right side, ordered five bottles of champagne. <laughs> Why would he sell a ticket to you and not to Susan, even if you are first online? So Marijn Kingma of Hukker in Amsterdam will discuss how GDPR may affect the music industry. Thank you, Peter. Um, I will also discuss whether or not the example Peter just gave is still allowed. Um, yeah, so I have the honor today to tell you something about the GDPR, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation. And I am assuming you have all heard a at least a little, bit some, uh, a little bit about the GDPR, even if you're not from the European Union, um, since it was quite hard to miss, unless you never used the internet. Um, and I will tell you, as Peter explained today, a little bit about how to deal with the GDPR in the music industry, and especially um, when organizing events such as concerts and festivals. Um, so there has been kind of a panic lately, a panic reaction to the GDPR. Every one of you has probably received a lot of emails uh, in the past uh, couple of weeks uh, asking for consent and asking to read the new privacy notices. Um, and if you live in Europe, you may have already uh, have also noticed that some companies took quite drastic measurements. Um, some websites have blocked access from the EU altogether. 
Um, some companies, such as the Washington Post, as you can see here, are now offering premium EU sus subscriptions, um, which come down to having to pay $30 more per year to not be followed by advertisers, as you can see here. Um, so the GDPR has at least created, already created much more privacy awareness. But it has also generated a lot of critique. Many people are calling it bureaucratic, and as you can see, some companies um, well, just block EU customers altogether because it's so bureaucratic or they ask you to pay a lot of money to uh, keep your privacy. Um, so the reason I think people find the GDPR exaggerated um, is that a lot of people think, well, I have nothing to hide anyway. And that might also be the reason that people just consent to everything on the internet, leave all their uh, uh, personal information just because um, it's an annoying pop-up, they want to uh, press consent because they want to read, I don't know, about Britney Spears' new boyfriend or the answer to the question of why men have nipples or something. Important <laughs> things you can find on the internet. But the question is, is, are we being wise? Do you really have nothing to hide? And I think in the past few years, still, <laughs> still laughing. In the past few months, it has become more and more clear that we should maybe be a little bit more protective of our personal data. Um, well, you've all heard about the Facebook, Cambridge Analytica scandal, uh, which has shown that social media um, uh, do a lot more with our personal data than we thought and are possibly even influencing elections. Uh, speaking of which, Donald Trump has last year tried to obtain the IP addresses of people who are visiting anti-Trump websites, which is also a kind of scary thought if you think about it. Um, and these are all data that we ourselves leave on the internet and don't think twice about. Um, so the EU decided that, uh, uh, well, someone has, something has to be done and decided to take privacy uh, very serious and start a privacy police, the GDPR police. And they also created a, a very, I think, very effective incentive to be compliant. If a company is not compliant, there are very high fines, up to 20 million dollar uh, euros, and uh, or four percent of your annual turnover. So that can really be a high number. So this is why a lot of companies are now asking consent for everything they do, and everyone is drowning in paperwork. However, it's not always necessary to ask for consent, and it's also not always smart to ask for consent. Um, why? The GDPR has very strict rules on how to ask for consent. Um, interestingly enough, I think it might, might have something to do with the hashtag MeToo scandal we just heard about from Monica, but when you Google consent, you get a lot of results about how to obtain consent from a woman. Um, for doing certain certain things and not really GDPR consent. But, um, so for example, I found this image from Planned Parenthood, which is also very applicable to the GDPR, so I decided to use it anyway. It's also a very good memory uh, jogger. If you just remember fries, you know how to uh, ask for consent. Um, so, as uh, with women, under the GDPR, consent also needs to be freely given, reversible, informed and specific. I don't know about enthusiastic though, that might be a plus, but I don't think it's um, necessary under the GDPR to be enthusiastic about giving consent. Um, but reversible, that means that, something can, that someone can always withdraw their consent. And that is the first reason that asking for consent is not always the best way to go. For example, uh, you, because you, you might need uh, to use someone's personal data if after they've withdrawn their consent. Um, very simple uh, example, if you have sold a personal non-transferable ticket uh, with someone's name, uh, you need to keep their name to do checks at the entrance to make sure that this is the same person that bought the ticket. If someone withdraws their consent, that is no longer necessary, so that's not a good solution. Uh, that brings me to the next point. Consent also needs to be freely given, the F in fries. Uh, the GDPR clarifies that if you ask for consent, but you don't make the service available if someone doesn't give you the consent, the consent is most likely not freely given. Um, for example, if you, wanted to, if you want to buy a ticket through Ticketmaster, you have to create an account. Uh, and before the GDPR, they've changed it now, uh, this is how Ticketmaster asks for consent to process your personal data. It says here, you agree that Ticketmaster can contact you with newsletters and general marketing. 
However, if you just wanted to buy the tickets and you didn't want to agree to Ticketmaster following you, you that would, wasn't possible. You had to consent to uh, marketing emails and marketing information in order to buy the tickets. And that will no longer be allowed under the GDPR. So, in conclusion, asking for consent is quite complicated and not always necessary. Um, as it says here, no consent, no processing, that's fake news. That's how the British Information Commissioner's Office puts it. Um, so without consent, uh, a lot of things are still possible. For example, uh, a concert organizer may still s uh, sell tickets, manage a fan page, use personal data of customers to uh, send direct marketing, for example, information about other concerts that may be interesting, uh, and send the personal data to a security company. And this is all possible as long as it's necessary for performing a contract or if it's necessary for the legitimate interest of the controller or a third party. As long as you speci specify why you need the data and as long as you inform your customers this is sufficient, you don't need to ask everyone for consent all the time. There are some exceptions. There, there are some uh, types of uh, processing of personal data where you always need a, uh, consent. Um, firstly, if you want to process sensitive personal data, such as data about race or data about uh, sexual preference, you need consent. Um, if it's about tracking location data, you need consent. And if you want to make decisions solely based on profiling, you also need consent. And now I'm getting to the answer to Peter's question. Um, if a company wants to track visitors, visitors of a concert or a festival and see where they go, they're going, um, you need consent. And that's also true if you want to make a profile of visitors who are buying beers or bottles of champagne and you want to then um, make a decision on whether or not to sell them tickets for the next festival based on that profile. If you want to do that, you also need consent. Uh, and if you want to do it, if an organization wants to do that on the basis of consent, remember, fries, Planned Parenthood, uh, you need freely given and specific consent. So you cannot make the consent part of your general terms and conditions. And if a customer does not give you consent, you still need to give him access to the concert or the festival. So it, is it still possible to do this? Are there any alternatives? Um, well, it would be, the question is, would it be GDPR compliant if you offer, for example, free drinks, free beer, or a discount to visitors if they consent to being tracked? Um, so that is, that, I think that's going to be the new question of the future. Will paying for personal data, or as we saw with the Washington Post, paying for privacy uh, become the future? And the question is whether or not that will be allowed under the GDPR. The GDPR is not clear on that, um, and we will have to wait for case law to see what happens and how this turns out. Um, one small thing, I have one minute left. Um, please note that even if you have grounds for the processing of personal data, the, the processing still needs to be proportional. A good example of this is the, or a good example, not a good example of this was the Tomorrowland uh, 2017 festival in Belgium. The organizers here provided the names of uh, people who bought a ticket uh, to the festival to the police who performed a screening. And on the basis of that screening, access was denied to 38 visitors. And the police stated on television uh, that access was denied if these uh, people were involved in serious matters such as terrorism or drug dealing. Um, so that's, those were some pretty serious accusations. And some of the people who were denied access went to court. And the court ordered that uh, they should have been given access, they should be given access anyway. Uh, they, ruled that there was a violation of privacy. The fact that these people were denied access and had to tell their friends that they couldn't go to the festival uh, had a very stigmatizing effect, especially because they said on television that uh, they only did that for people who were dealing drugs or uh, maybe were involved in terrorism. Um, and the judge ruled that the measure was disproportionate. This was a Belgium case, so if you have any questions about this, please ask Peter. If you have any questions about the GDPR, please ask me or send me an email with, to which I consent. Thank you very much. Thank you. If we could invite the next round of speakers, and thank you to the speakers on stage, we're going to switch up. So it's good to know that I, I can't be profiled on the basis of the uh, five bottles of champagne. That, that was just an example, right? <laughs> Hello, Isioma, did you get your presentation loaded? Awesome. All right, well, you're first up, so don't get too comfortable. While we're switching gears here, 
Um, let me introduce Isioma. We're so happy to have a, someone present from Nigeria and it be Isioma this year. It's been a number of years that we've heard about the Nigerian music economy and law. And Isioma Digby, who's head of the media and entertainment department at Panuka Attorneys and Solicitors in Nigeria, will provide insight into the push to transform the Nigerian creative industries into a major economic driver. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, like they said, my name is Isioma Idibe, and I'm coming all the way from Lagos, Nigeria, to be here. And I would like to thank the IAEL for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I've just been a member for about two years, so this is a really big deal. Uh, so to just go straight into it, because I don't have much time. Um, yeah. So just the overview of what we'll be discussing today, we we'll, would we'll go through just a brief statistical overview of the Nigerian media and entertainment industry, um, show some of the growth trends in the industry, the challenges hindering the transition from simply being a creative industry to becoming a creative economy, and some of the opportunities that are arising from these challenges. Sorry, slide. Oh. Yeah, okay. So um, in uh, 2006, there was a fall in oil prices, and that really had a significant impact on Nigeria. It highlighted um, loudly for the very first time that there was a major issue with the fact that we were extremely dependent on, and we still are, extremely dependent on oil as our major export. And this started driving a conversation as to looking at other non-oil exports that the, co uh, the country can uh, give out to get foreign, ex foreign reserves, because the fall in oil prices eventually led to an economic recession, which, thank God, we are coming out of now. Um, and so um, this then drove the National Bureau of Statistics to include the media and entertainment industry for the first time um, in the GDP calculation for Nigeria, and the results were astonishing. Um, it was found that the Nigerian media and entertainment sector led by the film and music sectors were, was contributing about 1.4% to the Nigerian GDP. And aside from that, it was employing informally about one million Nigerians. So, so this was really groundbreaking. And this was actually done before oil prices had fallen. But at the time oil prices fell, then this conversation was brought into the national spotlight. So just some um, statistics um, on, and there isn't a lot of data, unfortunately, on Nigeria. And these are some of the things that I've been working on with the National Bureau of Statistics and some other private sector individuals to start developing more data um, about our industry and what's going on. But this is just some data from PwC who have actually gone out of their way to do some really good research. And you see that in the major um, so you look at the world, you look at South Africa and Kenya being two other big economies in Africa, and Nigeria is still superseding in terms of um, growth rates. And if you look at the second slide, um, Nigeria has a population of about 190 million, and about 65% of that population is under 25. And if we look at the statistics on music consumption and generally general entertainment content consumption, that is the demographic that tends to con consume those things. And so we are well positioned you know, to continue to grow in terms of media and entertainment simply because of uh, the, the, the makeup of our, econo of our, of our population. Um, the Nigerian film industry, I'm sure everyone here knows, who knows about Nollywood, can indicate by raising your hand. So I know a lot of us know about Nollywood. Who knows Whiskey and Davido? Does anyone know those guys? Yeah, those are one of our biggest artists from Nigeria that have broken out um, internationally. And so Nollywood makes about uh, 2,500 films a year, making it the second largest film industry in the world. And the music industry in Nigeria, as at 2016, was generating $39 million. Um, so what is this saying? These are some pretty huge numbers um, from a country like Nigeria. And you can see the figures there indicating that it's going to only increase um, over the next couple of years. 
So just to quickly jump into it, what are the growth trends that we are seeing in, in the Nigerian media industry? Um, I want to go back a bit, actually. How do I go back? Yeah. Just to point out, if you look at um, the little pop-up there, it says growth will be strongly influenced by spurring spending on mobile internet access. This is, this is critical. Um, so if I go back to the growing trends, we are seeing a huge growth in digital penetration. I mean, the statistics, which of course, because of time, I couldn't sort of put all the statistics, but statistics are showing that 80% of people who are using the internet in Nigeria and over 80% are accessing the internet through their mobile devices. And the influx of cheap Chinese smartphones like Huawei, Techno, Solo, Infinix has completely changed the dynamic. So with 40,000 Naira, um, which is, uh, I can't put that in dollars, but it's really not a lot, the average Nigerian can have access to a smartphone and have access to the internet, YouTube, Facebook, and things like that. And this is how people are consuming entertainment content. We also have an improvement in the quality of data. So I think between last year and this year, we've now moved to LTE, which is a long you know, way away from when you know, I started using smartphones in Nigeria and you were struggling to um, see, load up a picture on Facebook. Now you're able to watch content and it loads up pretty fast. And there are moves to bring it to 5G LTE and there are companies coming into Nigeria and trying to provide that service. You have, you know, a lot of digital distribution platforms. So Netflix is in Nigeria, Hulu, Amazon is in Nigeria, and they are aggregating Nigerian content. Um, I think Spotify is considering a move to Nigeria. Apple Music is in Nigeria. And you're now able to pay for these services with your Nigerian card, which is making a huge difference. So I think Apple this year has grown from like 7,000 users to I think about 14,000. So it has doubled in one year once it was able to resolve people being able to make payments and subscribe for their services with their, um, with their Nigerian cards. And we also have increased pay TV subscription. So what has happened is in Nigeria, we have um, three major pay TV station, um, pay TV um, companies. Multi-choice DSTV, which is owned by NASPA. Then we have the Chinese-owned Star Times, and a new one has come in now, Kwesi TV. So what was interesting was uh, multi-choice came in and they started doing lower end bundles. So people can now buy in a subscription for about 1,000 Naira a month or something like that. So you have a lot of increased pay TV. The revival of the cinema culture in Nigeria is critical as well. We now have 35 cinemas in Nigeria and growing. Uh, so people are going to the cinemas and we've had a locally produced film, Wedding Party, that made about 500 million Naira at box office, which is about 1 million dollars. Um, government is also sort of stepping in. And one of the moves they've made is providing um, low interest loans through the bank of industry um, for people to engage in different types of um, entertainment content. Let me go back. Oof. Uh, okay, well, because I'm running long time, so I have to rush to this. So what are some of the challenges? Um, and another thing that was in the other presentation I really need to mention is we're also seeing an increase in intellectual property rights infringement um, actions being taken in court. Um, so what are some of the challenges hindering this transition? We have an inadequate stroke lack of industry structures. So if we're looking at music, for instance, as of now, our collecting society is defunct. They have, um, their license has been revoked by the um, Nigerian Copyright Commission. And the other collecting society is locked in a long litigation case against, um, which is called COSON, against COSON, um, which is arguing about the legitimacy of the organization. We have low level technical skill. This is across the broad in all levels of service. Um, limited access to high quality equipment, limited access to financing, which goes back to the lack of structure because invest, it's very risky to invest in Nigeria. We don't have enough data, so you can't really figure out where your money is going to come back from. Um, limited domestic and inter international distribution avenues. Inadequate legislation is a major issue. Our Copyright Act is not dealing with issues as regards music, like music publishing. They are not dealing with a lot of issues. So, so we, we really need to um, update our laws. Poor intellectual property rights. Um, 
protection. I know everybody knows about the piracy issue in Nigeria. It is literally killing the industry. Um, and um, low and ineffective government part um, participation. And why I, why I put a low and ineffective is because whilst we do have this bank of industry loans, um, the execution of the funding is not well planned. So whilst the intention is good because there is no plan, it's not hitting the critical places where it needs to hit to, to create structure. So what are the opportunities? Consultancy, distribution, gaming, capacity building, in terms of training and equipment rentals. So these are the places where I think people um, who want to be involved in the Nigerian entertainment industry need to play, um, because these are the places where we have gaps that need to be filled. So I, I hope that you know, if you know, it was very quick, but I hope it was helpful. And you can always meet me after if you have any more questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Izioma. In our music mix, uh, you heard in the beginning, there was also a hit uh, from the Swedish band to Europe called The Final Countdown, which brings me seamlessly to the next topic. Uh, Sophie Gorsens of Reed Smith will report on some important developments in the EU, and maybe she can also tell us whether there's a final countdown to the directive on copyright in the digital single market. Hi. Um, so yeah, Peter and Susan have kindly asked me to say a few things about Europe, what happened recently in Europe. Um, it's going to be difficult to cover everything because as many of the Europeans uh, in the room know, there's been a lot happening in Europe um, recently. Can we have the slides, Guy? Please? Thank you. Uh, so yeah, a lot has been happening, just to name a few, e-privacy, obviously GDPR, but that's now in effect, it's not something that is in the pipeline. But e-privacy, the uh, reform of the audiovisual media service directive, the sat satellite cable regulation, uh, and so forth and so on. I, I could go on and on for the next 10 minutes, but obviously we want to focus on just a few things, and we want to um, just take a look at three things. Um, one thing is obviously we cannot uh, have a conversation about uh, copyright without mentioning the uh, new copyright directive that is being discussed since 2016 and is still being debated as we speak. Um, secondly, uh, I think it will be interesting to take a look at one case, which is the Pirate Bay case, just because we have now some new information about the communication to the public right. And then finally, uh, I cannot leave this room without saying a few words about this new program, which is going to be a dedicated program for the uh, music industry in Europe, which is called Music Moves Europe. So, the copyright directive. Um, first thing, I am not going to be discussing the value gap, just because there is a panel tomorrow, I believe in the same room, which is going to be discussing and debating the value gap proposal for an hour. So I invite you all to come to that uh, if you want to know more about this topic. For today, what I would like to discuss is um, other things and other uh, articles in the directive which will have an impact on the music industry and um, things that you should be interested in, hopefully. The first article that I think is of interest to the music industry is Article 3, which is dealing with text and data mining. Um, so it's a text and data mining, Article 3 is creating an exception. Uh, and you will see that I have um, voluntarily drafted the slide without, instead of looking at the exception, I'm looking at uh, the other side of the medal, which is if you create an exception, it means that you create an obligation if you do not meet the criteria um, to benefit from the exception. So what Article 3 is uh, trying to achieve is to say that uh, whenever you need to do text and data mining on data which happens to be embodied within copyright, copyrighted material, um, whether or not you need permission from the rights holders and wh whether or not this is uh, engaging uh, the, uh, in a copyright relevant act. Um, so the two things that are covered, first, reproducing content in order to perform text and data mining. Second, extracting content from a database. And I'm just really quickly going to remind uh, our American friends in the room which that um, Europe has a thing which is called 
um, protection of database, which to the best of my knowledge doesn't exist in the US, which means that uh, databases can be protected by copyright if they meet uh, the criteria of originality, but also by a right which is called a sui generis right, uh, even if they do not meet a criteria of originality, but if there has been some significant investment and effort that has been um, uh, invested in creating the database. Um, so the article, the exception under Article 3 would cover those two acts, except if you already have another exception who is covering uh, the act, and that exception would be the exception of Article 5 of the um, copyright, the existing copyright directive for uh, temporary acts of reproductions when they are part of a technological process. So this is really interesting for one uh, reason. The reason why I'm, I'm spending a little bit of time on it, not too much hopefully, is because for um, the AI, and when you look at all the conversations that the, uh, is happening at the moment in Europe around AI, uh, you always go back to the question that AI is uh, relying only on the analysis of underlying data. And a, a large amount of data need to be analyzed in order for any AI algorithm to function. So uh, whether or not those AI algorithms are going to be able to run and to feed and to train onto copyrighted material is going to be um, decided and, and there's going to be a big impact of this Article 3 on how um, AI is going to be uh, understood and construed under European law. Um, the second thing that I wanted to discuss is the Article 14, 15, 16. This is also something that's going to have an impact on the music industry. And these three articles deal only with the fair remuneration of creators. Um, very quickly, they create new transparency obligations um, where the um, rights holders who are exploiting the rights of creators will have to give timely, sufficient, adequate, proportionate and effective reportings on everything they do with the works. It creates a contract adjustment mechanism which is an additional remuneration when the one originally agreed upon is deemed to be disproportionately low compared to the subsequent relevant revenues and benefits derived from the exploitation of the work. This is a mechanism that is already in existence in certain countries in the European Union, but not in others, and it's obviously creating um, a fair dose of uh, nervousness or um, amongst the countries who do not have this mechanism in place as of today. And then the last uh, thing that this is creating is a dispute resolution mechanism uh, which would apply for both the uh, transparency obligation and the contract adjustment mechanism. One other thing that I wanted to mention is that there's been a lot of lobbying uh, in relation to these uh, articles to go one step further. So there's been a lot of lobbying happening at European level for creating an unwaivable right to obtain um, equitable remuneration for all creators whose works are exploited online and that this new right would have to be managed by collective management organizations. Um, it seemed that the music industry and the performers were pushing a lot for this new right to be created. Um, it seems like at the moment the audiovisual industry is now uh, the one who is leading this campaign and this um, attempt to introduce a um, unwaverable right for uh, creators to uh, in Europe. And th that right would be collected directly with the platforms who are distributing the work. So the Spotify, the Netflix of this world will have to pay directly the CMOs if this um, idea sees, is ever enacted. I'm going to uh, canter through the Pirate Bay case because I'm uh, definitely was too ambitious with everything I wanted to cover. But the Pirate Bay case is really an interesting one for one reason. We now have clarity, a bit more clarity on um, the acts that are being performed by intermediaries. And the reason why the um, Pirate Bay case is so interesting is because most of the time when you have an internet intermediary uh, which is in, uh, involved in a case, most of the time you look at it from the uh, safe harbor point of view. So the liability exemptions that have been created by the e-commerce directive in Europe, which is roughly the equivalent of the DMCA safe harbor status in the US. 
And so most of the time, you don't even get to the point of knowing whether or not the intermediary is engaging in a copyright relevant act because it's covered by the exception. Um, whereas in this case, the European Court of Justice decided not to look at the e-commerce directive because it was not part of the question, and they decided to stick to the question that was asked to them, which was, does the Pirate Bay platform, the Pirate Bay website, uh, the, itself engage in an act of communication to the public, um, or is it only the user? And um, the court found that, yes, the user was definitely engaging in an act of communication to the public when they upload content to the platform, but the platform is also engaging in an act of communication to the public, and that is the novelty uh, of this decision which is to really uh, reinforce this idea that you, although you are an intermediary, you can be uh, engaging in an act of communication to the public. The other thing that's interesting in this decision is the fact that the, um, the, the notion of jointly communicating was also um, uh, reinforced by the court. And the um, and last thing that is interesting too is we see that the, this notion of intervening in an act of uh, communication to the public is, is being diluted, or at least the, the moral element is being diluted. So the European Court of Justice went from this idea of having an indispensable role to having a deliberate uh, role to now having a, a conception of this idea of uh, the role that you have and that you take in an act of communication to the public is much more subtle and it looks like we are moving towards a more um, objective responsibility which means anyone who, uh, who is playing a role could potentially uh, be deemed to be engaging in a copyright protected act. Um, I don't have time to talk to you about Music Moves Europe, but they have a stand on one of the floors in the Palais, so I invite you to go and speak to them because there are going to be exciting things happening in Brussels in terms of funding for the music industry. Thank you very much, Sophie. Incredible that uh, the Copyright Act allows courts to come in and rewrite contracts. Graham, we're very pleased to uh, have you step up next or speak from your seat if you prefer. Um, Graham has been a tireless advocate for copyright reform in Canada and remains so because our Copyright Act uh, has been very slow to update. Today, Graham's going to talk to us about another institution in Canada which sets remuneration for creators, uh, the Copyright Board, which is also uh, woefully out of date. Graham Henderson is the President and CEO of Music Canada, which is the Canadian Recording Industry Association, and he will tell us about that. I don't sure why I've only been given seven minutes. Yes, he gets 10. Yeah. Um, so, uh, hello everyone. Um, you know, Music Canada, just for those who don't know, is a passionate advocate for everything to do with music uh, in Canada, and, and we like to extend our borders. We represent Sony, Warner, and Universal uh, narrowly, but uh, we like to challenge the status quo. Uh, we do massive amounts of research. Uh, we originated the Music Cities concept. Uh, we're actively engaged in music education initiatives in Canada. Canada. We have an artist engagement uh, program and uh, at lunch uh, the, uh, the uh, grassroots panel which you're going to see uh, that we sponsor it features uh, Miranda Mulholland who is a product of that artist engagement uh, and by the way it is a program on value gap so you don't have to wait till tomorrow for the value gap. Uh, we also like to convene and host and sponsor uh, events uh, like the one at lunch and also our global forum which takes place every year in Canada which featured Dr. Stacy Smith who is very involved as Monica was pointing out uh, in the inclusion uh, movement in the United States. But today I'm here to provide an update on our efforts to modernize our copyright board uh, in Canada. Now Canada's copyright board is, is like the weather. Uh, everybody complains about it uh, and uh, nobody ever does anything about it. In fact, you feel you can't do anything about it. But there were a lot of reasons for this. Uh, the first and most obvious is that criticizing or complaining about the very people who sit in judgment over you and your tariff rates uh, can be risky business. The second reason is that the Copyright Board of Canada, in collaboration with bureaucrats in the federal government, had built the board into a mythical and mystical creature above reproach 
and beyond the reach of political mandates. It's made up of judges and staffed by career civil servants uh, who had entrenched themselves uh, in layers of bureaucratic protection. Um, ministers of different political stripes were met with the same answer uh, when we were raising concerns about the board to their officials. And the answer was, the board is a quasi-judicial tribunal that reports to Parliament through you the political powers that be, but makes decisions independently of you. But the board should not be protected. It is slow, dreadfully slow. The average hearing takes three and a half to seven years. In fact, the study that quantified delays at the board came with an asterisk noting that many hearings of over seven years were still active at the time of the report, meaning that the seven-year statistic was going to go up, not down. It's also inefficient, and it lacks transparency in its decisions. For instance, the board often demands external expert testimony from stakeholders, but often discards it in favor of the work of their own analyst which is an analyst which is not tested uh, before the uh, advocates. And all of these issues add up to lost dollars for creators. Every dollar spent at the copyright board on a broken process is money that is not going into the pockets of copyright holders. So we set out to modernize the board, uh, and here's what we learned. First, uh, we couldn't stack the deck and we couldn't go alone. To create a board that benefits all creator and music industry stakeholders, we realized that uh, reforms needed to be of general application. Every stakeholder has a particular ruling that has wronged them or some, uh, something specific that they would like to see overturned. But political decision makers stop listening to you when you complain about your own specific problem. It's too self-serving, and the argument that you are just trying to undo a decision for yourself, well, that can stick to you. So we gathered the broad strokes on what needed to change, and we worked to ensure all stakeholders could align toward a common sense set of goals. Our ask was simple, descriptive and action-oriented. We wanted a copyright board, you probably all want copyright boards, that are faster, more efficient, and more transparent. We needed a spotlight. In May of 2016, we arranged for a major independent intellectual property think tank in Canada to host a conference on the concerns of the future of the Copyright Board. Critics and supporters of the board spent the day discussing the finer points of the legal issues of the board. This included the introduction of two studies of the board, one quantitative and one qualitative. The conference was successful in proving that there might just be something wrong at the board. The conference opened the door for a study politically. And through our advocacy network, we found a parliamentary committee with the capacity to take on a short study, with the interest to take on a short study. The Canadian political system gives a lot of power to an interested and engaged minister. Conversely, the civil service can grind good ideas to dust if the minister isn't pushing for it as a priority activity. So when the parliamentary committee decided to hold a short two-day study of the copyright board, the political staff in the minister's office were happy for the heads up that we'd provided them, but they didn't feel the need to attend the meeting. The board was, after all, they thought, quasi-judicial and independent of the minister. But here's where we got a little lucky. The study went as well as we could have hoped for. The senators heard from stakeholders who were unanimously concerned about the board, each echoing one another with calls for faster, more efficient, more predictable board. The requests were simple to grasp and seem sorry, simple to grasp and seemingly easy in practice. The senators were sold. Now all they had to do was hear from the board. 
Now, in the political system in Canada, these meetings happen all the time. Stakeholders come with a laundry list of demands, uh, politicians hear them out, and then officials follow behind uh, with calm, bureaucratically polite reasons for the, why the system should stay exactly the way it is. And the board could easily have followed that script when they appeared before the committee, but they didn't. Instead, in response to one of the first questions from a senator on the suggestion of implementing, say, for example, a one-year timeline, the board representative said, well, what would be the sanction if we don't respect the deadline of one year? Very quickly, it unraveled, and the meeting turned into a total disaster for the copyright board. The senator spent an hour attacking their credibility and responses to concern to concerned stakeholders. And importantly, three weeks later, they released a report calling on the minister to bring some sanity to the board. And the tagline of the report was this. The Copyright Board of Canada is dated, dysfunctional, and in dire need of reform. And just like that, the Copyright Board became a political problem. Working with political decision makers on this file has been very interesting. They have agreed that there is a need for reform, uh, but they are very concerned about the risk of breaking the system. We have invested significant resources into alleviating the concerns of political players and bureaucrats alike that a reformed board could work and that they wouldn't be walking off a cliff. This has meant engaging with other stakeholders who are not always allies. And one area was engaging artists in the battle to make it clear that the board meant something to people other than lawyers. The government launched a consultation process in the dead of summer last year, and we worked very hard to make sure that everyone participated and that to the greatest degree possible, they heard the same key messages. In fact, Canadian musician and label owner Miranda Mulholland, who you are going to hear at lunch, and she's one of the, if not the top, artist advocate in Canada and one of the best in the world. Well, she spearheaded a letter to the Prime Minister of Canada signed by over 100 artists to which she recently received a reply promising action. And you can't read it, but it, it's, it's up there. Uh, and the full text is available on her Facebook page. The truth is that this presentation comes a couple of weeks too early. I would love to tell you exactly how this story ends, but the reform has not been announced yet. But there have been promising signs. The government announced a new IP strategy, and you won't believe what their promise is. Quote, regulatory decisions regarding IP will be faster, more efficient, and more transparent, using our language. The truth is that we expect an announcement soon, and in response, we will provide political decision makers with our full support in social and traditional media. We hope to turn this entire process into a positive creator's story. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. We also heard in our music mix, Don't Look Back in Anger, that uh, has been sung countless times by the people of Manchester in remembrance of those who died after the bombing at the Ariana, Ariana Grande concert. Although human concerns always have priority after these dramatic events, of course, we thought it would be interesting to learn more about the financial concerns and more specific insurance claims and the cancellations of concerts as a result of acts of terrorism. And when we asked Martin Goebbels, director of Integro Insurance Brokers, whether he could tell us about uh, the specific uh, uh, topic he answered, sure, cancellation, these day cancellation insurance these days is my daily diet. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, it's a bit of a first for me. I've got to say, mostly at music conferences um, for these speeches, insurance is used to clear the room at the end of a, a session. Um, certainly not as interesting as why men have nipples, um, but I can't answer that one either. Um, so it seems a little bit out of context in terms of some of the very technical and interesting um, speeches earlier. Um, but my speech today is split into two sections. Uh, to some extent, they overlap. Um, terrorism is a topic that has come to the front of everybody's minds and awareness in recent years, um, obviously with incidents across the world and in, and in many different circumstances. 
Uh, with regards to live events, it has, of course, had a big, big impact, mainly with the increased security required, whether that's at small venues or large festivals. This, in turn, increases the costs and inevitably uh, discussions, let's call it, um, as to who pays. Um, terrorists use many ways of causing death and injury and disruption, and rarely, if ever, the same scenario, apart from perhaps the overall description of just using guns and knives. Um, I've attended several conferences on the subject, and in the words of experts, um, there is no real overall way to stop acts of terrorism, uh, but maybe just ways to reduce the impact for the public and, and for the music industry in this particular case. Um, so I'm here to discuss the impacts after, of, after an event and who is responsible and to what extent. Insurance has therefore become more important with many people now buying terrorism insurance, which is excluded as a, a standard procedure under most um, types of insurance policies. Uh, a lot of this I can only really talk for UK insurance, not for every country around the world. Um, but also, once an incident happens, people check in their show contracts to establish their, permission, their position on payments. And sadly, too many people check their contracts too late, um, especially for something so boring as insurance. Uh, with regards to liability insurance, it's hard to be too specific on an international audience, as each country can vary greatly in their legal responsibilities, although I'm always happy to listen to any views and experiences anybody has. Um, I believe, for example, in America, the topic of liability insurance is far more stringent than many countries around the world, and as an example, on the mass shootings at the Route 91 Harvest Festival in Las Vegas uh, at the end of last year, I understand there are lawsuits against the promoter for negligence. Um, which is pretty tough, really, remembering this was a lone gunman situated firing from a hotel outside of the festival grounds, for which he's got no, no um, security or responsibility. It's unlikely that same lawsuits would have any grounds in several other countries. Uh, I couldn't find, for instance, any such reports of uh, legal action after the Paris Bataclan shootings. Um, However, I'm able to comment a bit more on cancellation insurance due to terrorist reasons, and sadly this type of insurance has become commonplace in the UK in the last few years. Certainly in the, most, in the past, most promoters felt they had no risk, but various events occurring inside their venues or in the immediate surrounding areas or elsewhere have highlighted the risks beyond the confines of their own venue sites. These policies also cover against threat of terrorism, um, which is once it's confirmed by the local authorities, and this is perhaps as a bigger risk or as big a risk to a show than an actual incident as it could easily affect travel for the artists or their public as well as the use of a venue. While terrorism insurance protects, against, uh, protects you when local authorities deem it's unsafe to play, it will never cover disinclination to play by an artist. If a band simply decide they don't wish to perform or to continue with their tour and they want to return home, that can't be insured. And there have been a couple of cases recently where legal action has been brought, and I think Peter wanted me to perhaps go into a little bit more detail than I'm able to, especially in a room full of lawyers. Um, national mourning is another area that uh, is covered under, certainly under a UK insurance policy, and this can be due to a national disaster, which can include terrorist incidents, but also death of, deaths of a monarch or leaders, uh, although it's often got age restrictions, often 65. Um, and that can be a hard subject for insurers when people are asked to quote for an international tour, as each country has different plans and it can be almost impossible for an insurer to calculate each country's standings and therefore the length of any national mourning um, or how many of their leaders qualify for national mourning. Uh, for example, I believe that in one part of the United Arab Emirates there are as many as 70 people and their families that if anything happened to them would qualify for national mourning and long periods of it. Uh, in the UK, it's still not known exactly what will happen when our Queen passes, and she's now in her 90s, or Prince Philip, and that makes it very difficult to in for insurers to calculate the risk. Uh, if the morning is due to a terrorist incident or a national disaster, each country can have very differing periods. Anyway, I think after Paris it may have been three weeks, some countries it could be for a month or, or longer. Um, so there's whole insurer markets in the UK specialising in terrorism insurance nowadays. Um, there have been many claims paid, and while the general cancellation market, other than terrorism, has seen rates rise in the last 12 months due to colossal claims suffered by insurers, there has not been any major increase in terrorism premiums in the last couple of years. There's, some cities have seen increase, uh, increases, but many have reduced. Um, obviously, it's very specific to, to situations. However, of course, that can change overnight if another tragedy occurs somewhere in the world. 
Um, obtaining quotes these days involves a great amount of time and work as each country and city can carry different rates depending on world events at any one time. This involves spreadsheets and facts and figures. And um, I don't expect anyone to feel sorry for us, but gone are the days when we could answer the usual question, can you give me a quick ballpark figure for my budget? Um, this moves me on to the overall subject of cancellation insurance and who is responsible. Following non-terrorist incidents such as volcanic ash, tsunamis and general terrible weather, I've spent a lot more time than I would have expected, uh, or probably than I would have liked, not being a lawyer and not being able to charge by the hour, um, reading and offering my personal opinions and my non-legal advice on contract clauses and the problems that, that may occur due to the confusing way that they are set out. Uh, I find this frustrating and not because I don't care about my clients, but mainly because booking agents, particularly and to some extent managers, don't want to read contracts, as I mentioned earlier, especially when it comes to boring things like force majeure and insurance. Um, a lot of these contracts I found may be unchanged for, for years and no one has really thought about the implications, in, especially in a never-changing world. They don't want to consult lawyers, often as they see it as somebody else's problem. Well, normally they see it, everyone sees it as someone else's problem. Um, and I'm sure many of you here also find that contracts aren't fully checked by clients until a problem's occurred. My main point to my clients is that there is no insurance term of force majeure, so we can never answer the simple common question, am I covered for force majeure? Uh, my second point always is that insurance will only ever fall in line with contract terms. So if a contract states, for example, a promoter must pay an act under certain circumstances, then that is what must happen. And insurers will not pay if he doesn't, which is simply deemed a breach of contract. The most common example I see for any description of force majeure is force majeure shall include, but is not limited to, and then it goes on to list 15 different things. And I hope with your legal mind, you'll agree that this makes no sense. If it's not limited, then basically anything can be deemed a force majeure. Often leaves us scratching our heads as to what or whether a particular situation could be deemed force majeure or an act of God or something totally new. Increasingly, force majeure cancellation clauses specify terrorism, but there are wide-reaching possibilities as I've never seen one specify where such terrorist incidents must occur. For example, if an actor in Paris and a situation occurs there that makes travel away from Paris impossible or delayed, and they can't travel to the next show in Madrid, should that Spanish promoter still pay the act his fees uh, or not? And if the Spanish promoter had insured his own costs, would it be sufficient if a terrorist act happened a few hundred miles away and another country in the act can't arrive? Martin, uh, which leads I'm sorry, we are running out of time. I'm on my last page. Okay. <laughs> uh, leads me briefly to, uh, actually I'll, I'll skip over that last bit. Um, so uh, medical issues I was going to mention as well, it, you know, they really should be touched on by um, thing, but I think it's not necessarily relevant here. So that's it, I will okay. happily cut off. Thank, Thank you. you. Very sorry, but uh, no, no. we're seriously running out of time. Coffee is waiting for us. Uh, so I'm afraid this is the end of our update session. I hope you learned a lot, speaking for myself. A couple of months ago, I didn't know what an inclusion rider was until the moment we started to prepare this program and Susan made me sign one. I don't know whether you noticed, but we had at least uh, five female speakers on the stage. Thanks for joining us. Enjoy, come, enjoy, meet them, and many thanks to all of our speakers. Thank you.